Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Trogly's Guitar Show. Well, it's that time of year again where I have to painstakingly take out every single guitar in my collection and show it to you guys as a big thank you for following me throughout the year. This is the 2022 Trogly Collection. And hey, if you're interested in learning more in-depth, detailed information on any of these guitars, pretty much all of them have reviews and demos. So just go to YouTube, type in Trogly and the model I'm talking about, and you should be able to find the video. If not, leave me a comment, and I'm sure I can find it for you. The first guitar on the menu tonight is a 1962 Gibson SG Ebony Block Vibrola. We had just recently documented this one on the show. I bought it from the original family this year. But it ended up the neck pickup was dead. Had to send that off to Lindy Fralin. It got rewound, but this thing cleaned up so beautifully. But ultimately, I've decided I'm going to find a new home for it just because true vintage, as you'll see today, is not what I specialize in. I like the whole 70s to 90s stuff with a little bit of a mix of modern day. But who knows? I could change my mind. Our next one is a Walnut The Strat. This is just here on consignment. It's not part of my personal, personal collection. That's right, some of this is considered inventory. I'll let you know if it's part of my personal stash or not. So this one's currently on my website if you are interested in it. But these are always such beautiful Stratocasters. Awesome wood grain on this one. Not only on the front, but also on the back. Moving over here, this is just a regular 2005 Les Paul Standard. They're starting to become vintage in their own right, scarily enough. This particular one is a very nice example, not because of the top necessarily. I mean, it's got a nice top, don't get me wrong. This is my quilt back Les Paul standard. That's just cool figuring within the body on this one. That's very nice. It pairs well with another one in my collection that we'll see a little later on because first we need to take a look at this Les Paul KM. I've had this one for about a year or two now. It is a beautiful natural example, part of the first run. And the way that you can tell it's part of the first run is because of that big giant custom made plaque right here slapped on the front. I had initially purchased this one for resale, but I'm honestly kind of glad it just kind of never got officially listed on Reverb because it's actually in pretty clean shape and I would like a custom made plaque version of every single KM color, which traditionally is natural cherry sunburst and tobacco sunburst, but I actually saw a black KM show up this year. Over here is a rather unassuming mid-2000s Les Paul Standard again, but this time it still has the 60s neck sticker on the headstock. And it's pretty heavy, but what makes this one special and why I kept it in my collection is once again we have an interestingly figured back. I describe it as like a tiger claw back. It just like marked it all up and it's got a cool chatoyant effect to it. It's not really coming across too well in this lighting situation, but I thought that made it cool enough to stay around. And because of the fact that it's a Yamano exclusive, which is a Japanese dealer that had P90 pickup. So it tied in with my whole collection of interesting figured back mid 2000s standards because these are the best standards you can buy outside of modern production. I really like that 2001 to 2006 era right before they started chambering. I'm currently bucket headless in my collection, but I do have the next best thing, which is the Buckethead SG. That's not actually called that in the slightest. This is called the SG Baritone. It's a 27 inch scale length Gibson SG that's all white, pretty much all bucket head specs, except for the fact that we don't have the push button kill switches. This is another one I had initially purchased thinking, ah, yeah, probably resale, but then it instantly became like a keeper because it was in pretty clean shape and these are starting to become scarce. So no time like the present to secure one of these. This year, I'm happy to announce I started the Guitar of the Week collection. That's 47 guitars, kind of 48, just depends how you look at it. If you count the Joan Jett signature model as part of it when it got cancelled or not. I don't remember what week this one is off the top of my head, but it's one of the hardest ones to find, especially in good shape. Like, this one's not even perfect. Some of that cool J200 borrowed design on our pick guard has been rubbed off. But it's a double cut white satin Les Paul Jr. I mean, it's just kind of an interestingly specked out guitar. And the fact that it's rare and part of a series just kind of makes me happy. So, no, I will not sell this one because it's as close as I found to perfect. But our next one over here is another one of those mid-2000s Les Paul standards. This time still with the 50s neck sticker. So I got the 50s neck and the 60s neck. But brace yourselves, this is my favorite one. The back on this is ridiculous. I've owned this for like four years now. I've been doing the collection videos since the year 2018, and I think you see this in almost every single one. I mean, that's, it, it's, it's dumb. It's just fantastic. And when you also see it's in the neck, this is a very extraordinary, ordinary example. It also weighs like 12 pounds. 
These two kind of go together. It's part of my Les Paul Vixen collection. I'd like a complete set of the Vixen as well as the Goddess series guitars. So this is our light baby blue. I think they called it like Caribbean blue or something like that. It's basically just a very slim Les Paul. They're not very desirable by any means. Some people will ask like crazy money for them, but whenever these are around a thousand bucks, I'll pick them up when they're in clean shape. They've got these interesting diamond inlays on them, but they were originally marketed towards women. However, since they're kind of cool, quirky custom colors now, there is a small collector base behind these, but most people go after those goddesses. But the red metallic finish this year was a great find. This is the hardest color to come by because it's the only one that was like a semi-gloss finish. All the other ones were really open pore satin as far as I'm aware. So finding this one in this shape and this color this year made me quite happy. Speaking of custom colors, here is a custom color Les Paul Catalina. So generally, these are like those Vixens. They have very vibrant colors to them. Like there's a nice blue, there's a red, there's a canary yellow, and there is a very rare black pearl out there. And when I purchased this, I thought I found my black pearl, but no, I just found straight up ebony, which is like <laughs> the exact opposite of what you think when you think Les Paul Catalina. But this is the series that predated the Elegant series, which is a much more popular one and known about a bit better than the Catalina series. And it's not a collection video if I don't show one of these guys off. It's a dual P90 wrap tail Les Paul DC Pro. So this is also from the late 90s where the custom shop was fairly new. They didn't exactly know what they were doing. So they were just trying a whole bunch of stuff. But this is a very rare version of it. I actually just collect these because I think they're so cool. Because normally you'll have a bridge tailpiece set up on these guys and it'll be humbuckers. But you can find the rare dual P90 versions as well. So these are always a treat when they show up to market. But 24 frets, double cutaway Les Paul. Yeah, that's right, you saw the headstock's a little bit weird. They call it the snakehead headstock because straight string pull. Pat Martino signature guitars also utilize that. And there's a few other models out there if that is your style. Basically their way to compete with PRS's headstock style. That concludes the collection. I hope you enjoyed tonight's episode. Don't mind the mess. Don't forget to like, comment, hey, wait. <laughs> this is just like room one of six and it was just like runoffs. <laughs> I've got three guitars over here, but that's top secret, like super big video. People will freak out. These, uh, I just want to say for an unboxing episode, they're part of that consignment collection that I am keeping. So you'll see those next year or shortly if you watch the show normally. But before we move to our next room, let's take a look at some of my parts collection. I collect these new old stock 70s and 80s Gibson parts. Now, do I collect 90s and 2000s? Yes, but I don't pay any type of a premium for those. So if you're selling anything like this complete in the box, please let me know. Dirty Fingers. T-Tap. Super Dirt. Golden Posi Locks. TP6 tailpiece in gold as well as chrome in the 70s boxes. The Schaller M6 style tuners, one of them with the flip out windings. Some new old stock, I think 90s, early 2000s parts. Here's some paperwork that we still need to go through together. Gibson's weird vibrolas that they toyed with in the 80s. A couple of other cool spare parts. Oh, and another fun collection is the, uh, the, the weird stuff that Gibson did in the late 2000s until the end of the Henry J era. And a cool shirt. And a Marshall amp I still need to unbox. I apologize in advance about the audio change, but not every room in my house is perfectly acoustically <laughs> treated like my recording area. So here we go, one of the mod collection guitars. It's still here. Nobody wants to buy this guitar from me. But that's all right, I'm starting to come around to it because this is one of the very early mod collection guitars where Gibson was just, you know, doing something new. But this is one of those ES Les Paul Customs from Gibson Memphis. And then they just gave it a new paint job around 2021 and they pinstriped it on top of that. But it's actually a satin widowed guitar. So it's got that nice gray coloring over top of it. So it is actually quite cool. So it will find a loving home eventually, but I do consider this one part of my inventory. This is one that I had purchased from a collection this year. I haven't gotten around to making a video on this yet, but this is a very early Les Paul classic, which definitely needs to be documented because the early first couple of year classics are worth a lot more than all the other ones. I might say, why is that? Some of it comes down to like the inlays 
and some of the finer detailed specs. I mean, this is by no means a crazy top or a custom color, but what makes this one kind of cool is the very low serial number. So this is 1990, the 423rd one made. Now, despite what a lot of forums will tell you, 1989 is actually the first official year, but 1990 is the first full year. So there are a few that trump this one. Next up here, we have a beautiful 1980 Les Paul Artisan. I had actually purchased this guitar back in a set this year, not too long ago, because I wanted to get a different guitar from the seller. This is a really great example of a two pickup Les Paul Artisan. I mean, I'm tempted to keep this one back because I've always loved the coloring on it. However, you know, the right offer, I, I think I would part with this one, because that's not the only artisan in my collection at this time. Same story on this 2550. It's a very nice example, but I only purchased it so I could get that other guitar that I wanted. But I've heard people talk about the lame horn of 2550s very often, but I've never been able to see it until I laid this down here to compare it to this other Norlin era one. These really do have quite a rounded cutaway on them. It almost looks like a the Heritage guitar. But these are pretty cool guitars. We'll see some more in the collection as well. This was a fun find by a dealer. I actually uh, paid what I consider top dollar for this one because it's a custom color, pearl white. Not that you can really tell in this poor lighting situation. You can actually see this guitar in the SG Elite video, and then you can kind of see the difference as compared to a pure white guitar, but it's got a nice metallic sheen to it. I love these 1982 customs with the very special parts like the posi lock strap locks and the flip out winding tuners. Here's a Les Paul KM, also part of that collection that I, I need to get these things listed, but they're just such nice guitars. It's like, I don't really want to sell them, but at the same time, they're, they're not necessarily up to my standard. They've got just, just a little bit too much wear for my tastes. That and I can't afford to keep all of these beautiful guitars if I also want to add non-duplicates to my collection, right? This one's actually from 2008, so this is a Les Paul Super Custom. Now, it's not one of the 80s ones. It's kind of a reissue tribute to it. I would highly suggest checking this video out if you're a fan of Neil Sean of Journey, because it's the guitar that he's famous for using, the reissue style of it. But what makes this one different from all those vintage guitars is the fact that they just decided to use a straight-up maple body on this instead of capping off the edges in the back. They just viewed that as being a little bit easier. Now, of course, we also have the ridiculously flame neck up here, but this one actually experienced a little bit of trauma in shipping. You can see that in the video a bit better, but it's got some finish checks in the typical break area. That was a little bit unfortunate, but I decided until I find one that's better, might as well just hold on to that because it's still a nice example. Speaking of cool examples, here's a Heritage 80 Elite. So basically, Heritage 80 Elite and Standards, the biggest difference is your fretboard material. So this guy's got ebony. Now the pickup covers have been removed from these Tim Shaw PAFs, but I've always loved this top. I had actually made a Wyron episode about this one about four years ago. So just like with these guitars over here that are part of a collection that I had to buy to get a different guitar, I was not sad to have to get this one on. And I've been very hesitant to put this one on the market just because of how nice that top is. Even though it's not typically in my clean condition that I normally have, but I also have a different one that you'll see later on today, which is why I would be okay passing this one on. This was one I'd kind of forgotten about because I had bought it, I unboxed it, and then it had to get stored away. I didn't have time to do the full review and documentation. This is a 1975 Les Paul Custom in what I consider bearded lady configuration. So it's got really nice flame on that side, then it's plain, and then it's really nice flame on this side. <laughs> So I just always call those bearded ladies, but I guess technically this is vintage sunburst because it's more of a black border, whereas tobacco has more of a brown color on the outside. But despite being a 1975 serial number, we still have the 1974 20th anniversary inlay, which is not all that uncommon. The only thing that makes me go, eh, maybe it's not the one for my collection, has nothing to do with the headstock or anything. It's... Some bozo put another strap button on the back. What's that all about? Now to change up the whole Norlin era things that we've been talking about here. We got Crocomelon Mod Collection guitar over here. This was a fun review. P94 pickups, which are humbucker sized P90s, and they've got the fake crocodile skin in there. It actually is a true R9 reissue. It's just been refinished. It looks a little bit strange. 
But it's a fun one. It even has a matching green back, although the back is satin and only the top is glossy. I'm curious to see what these DS serial numbered guitars do in the future, because this year they stopped using the Gibson original modified decals on the back and switched over to those ones on guitars that I view that they think were extra special, or maybe the serial number got lost and they just needed to rebrand them something. I could be making them something that they're not, but it's usually the really special ones. Speaking of special ones, here's just a regular gold top standard. Let's move on. Oh, wait. What is with that headstock? <laughs> this is a 12-string Les Paul Traditional. I'd kind of like a complete set of all the colors because I think there's an ebony one and a cherry sunburst, if I'm not mistaken. I actually have two of the gold top ones. I had purchased this from a fellow dealer friend of mine because I was just going to compare it just to see if it was nice or not and because I needed the pick guard for my other one. But the other reason is they both had flamed necks, which is pretty cool. Although this wasn't the best lighting to see that. This cool purple Les Paul Custom might blow your mind. It's called the Les Paul Custom Stealth. Yes, it's factory stock and original with EMG pickups. Check out the full review and demo to learn more. It is one interesting beast. Even has a cool little decal back here. I had purchased this from overseas this year. I know it was pretty far away, and this was a 1 of 25. Next up, we've got a Les Paul Jr. that was a Music Zoo exclusive. This is another one of those ones that nobody wants to seem to buy from me because it's the Les Paul Jr. rhythm. It was a lot of fun to document, but very limited buyer pool for that one because, you know, it's basically for jazz. Then over here, we have a beautiful Gibson Les Paul slash Brazilian Dream. This was definitely the year for interesting brass dream guitars because Gibson, uh, clearanced a lot of these on the demo shop. This was not one of those, and I've polished this up. I actually have two of these right now. We'll unbox a different one, and I'll tell you an interesting story of how I got that in a couple of days. But this one is slash number 60. It's currently on reverb. This year, I definitely came more appreciative of this model because it's now an underdog rather than just crazy overpriced plain top R8 that was $13,000. Here is a late Henry J era guitar. This is actually factory pinstriped. This is not the one I did my review and documentation on, but I kind of like these because it's like a blacked out bucket head kind of because you've got the same pickups in here, but they're a little bit thicker than a normal studio, or at least they look like it. So even though these were called Hot Rod Studios and you know the electric blue pinstriping isn't for everyone, these just have their whole own thing going on for them. And they kind of became slightly more rare, but this one's from 2014. Another interesting one from that time period is the DJ Ashba signature. Uh, it looks like a neck through, but it's not. It's just fancy designs. It's not everybody's favorite. And you've got a cool kill switch right here, but I had purchased this one on eBay to get a slightly better condition one than my review piece. But when I bought it, I could see writing on here that said, Hun, and my unboxing of this actually found the original owner of this. Apparently this guitar was an anniversary gift to him and he had to sell it at hard times and he was asking if he could buy this from me. But he doesn't have the money right now. He doesn't know when he will. <laughs> it's like, yes, I'll hold it for you as long as I can. So that's why I never ended up listing this. I'm not sure if he'll ever come back for it or if that was even a true story or not. But I mean, it, it's not in bad shape. So I guess this is just my DJ Ashba until he wants to come get it. Then over here we have a Tak Matsumoto, I think early 2000s one. Check the full review out for more details, but it's basically just a regular early 2000s standard, except for beautiful quilt tops, kind of cool custom pickups, custom case. You get black binding on it instead of cream, and you also get the abalone. This is a Japanese signature artist. And trust me, if you like the style of this one, he has many, 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 many signature guitars. He's essentially the slash of Japan, is a good way to put it. And over here, we've got a, a lone Ibanez this time. It's a Ichika Nito signature model. I guess I wouldn't mind having one of these in my collection, but this technically is inventory that hasn't sold yet. But I do like collecting YouTuber signature guitars, but generally, I'm more so about the Gibsons. All right, we gotta pick up the pace because we're not even halfway done. This is one of the Epiphone Wing series guitars. I purchased this because of the Limousine Band. 
So if you want to check out things like the Epiphone Beast and whatnot, definitely check that out. Here we've got the Jimi Hendrix, actually an artist proof Jimi Hendrix Love Drop Flying V. That is a pretty nice find this year. Although the right offer I think would take that from me because even though it's an iconic guitar, it's not necessarily my favorite. This Melody Maker I found this year, I thought it was just the regular red color when I had purchased it and I got an all right deal on it. But then it shows up and I see the side of the fretboard is painted too. And lo and behold, that means it was a custom color, ember red or cardinal red. I don't remember. I just like these 65 Melody Makers. The shape's a bit weird to get used to, but the neck profiles are fantastic. Here we've got the Dave Mustaine Flying Vs. They didn't sell too well, but I do actually have three of the bursts, not because I bought them up to resell. They are, two of them were actually traded to me from somebody who did that. And then I've got the Ebony one as well. They're interesting guitars. I think people will come to appreciate these a little bit more later on. And then here we've got another one of those P90s. So I don't think this is my personal collection one. I think the first one I showed you is the one I'm not going to sell. Whereas this one, I could be tempted to part with it if the offer was right. Down here, we've got the Guitar of the Week. I think it's number 47. It was canceled. It's not officially part of the Guitar of the Week series. It's the Joan Jett Signature Melody Maker. So I've been trying to find a minty condition one, right? And this one, it's got the plastic on the pick card. It's great. That's got like a small impression back here. I mean, it's not that big of a deal. So I was ready to keep it until I saw this. There's like a pen mark right here and somebody's tried to buff that off and it turned the satin finish into a complete gloss. So that is just there. So this one down here doesn't have the mark on the neck, but it looks like the wood grain got splintered out at the factory and painted in on this one right there. So I wouldn't consider either of these perfect. I mean, they're definitely collection worthy, but I think I'm, I'm just gonna keep hunting. Then we've got an 80s Flying V that is a signature color scheme for the Scorpions guy, Rudolph Schenker. You can learn all about that in the review and demo. Got the Lenny Kravitz Signature Flying V from the early 2000s. It's actually a black sparkle finish with a cool gold mirror pick guard. It's not the same one that I did my review and demo with. It is a different one because I had sold that, regretted it, and bought the next one that came up to market. Next up here, a very interesting set. This is a 1981 Gibson Flying V. Extra special. Factory issue. Super fancy. Look at that headstock. Nope, that's a lie. It is a 1981 Flying V, but it was made over, potentially by the late great Ed Roman. It was at least Romanicized. <laughs> but we had a fun little series about that this year. Speaking of another fun series, the Reverse Flying V. Samurai Guitarist and I did a nice little collab this year. That was fun. We've been in contact since, and that's always nice. This one's part of the Guitar of the Week series. Over here, we've got the Gibson Theodores. I think those came out this year. Yep, the serial number tells us 2022, and this was the third one made. That's why I kept this one. That's a low serial number. Kind of a controversial guitar. Some guys get it, some guys don't. I mean, it looks a bit doofy, but trust me, when you play them, they're very good. I love them. I mean, they were selling as much as eight to 10,000 on the used market. Now, since they've come down for the common colors over here, it seems people definitely prefer the natural. Well, that's okay. Those are three guitars in my collection that I'm like, I, I don't really care about the value. I just think it's cool to have all three. And 2022 was the year that I found my Donald Duck Telecaster. Very happy about that. Also the year that we documented the lawsuit proof guitar. Yeah, it's a... Uh, Gibson headstock for the body, Les Paul body for the head. You can't sue us over that. Speaking of weird guitars, here's a half Les Paul. Might seem kind of strange to own, but this is what the custom shop used to train new employees. So you could see, you know, yeah, there's the mahogany body, the maple top, mahogany neck, the maple block that caps off your truss rod. This is just a great little uh, museum display piece, I guess you could say. I also picked this up this year. It is one of the banjo necks from like the 30s or whatnot that the Gibson Les Paul Artisan borrowed the inlays from. I don't ever plan on putting this on a banjo body because, I mean, it's just a display piece for me. And then over here we got a Gibson U2. It's got a replaced middle pickup, but I picked this one up because it's got the rare Gibson Proud logo. You know, the big gaudy one. Usually the U2 just has a Gibson silk screen. I just haven't had time to list that one properly for sale. Similar story over here. We've got a RD standard bass. 
Something like that. It's been heavily modified. I'm not sure what I'm doing with this thing yet. And now we've got our freaky guitars to talk about. So I think this was the Halloween special episode this year. The biblically accurate guitar. Called that because of all the weird eyes that were put all over this thing. So I actually have an update to this guitar. This was not initially meant to be a demo shop guitar or a mod collection piece. This was actually an art contest held within Gibson. So we've talked about those Les Paul Studios that had the swirl paint jobs that were very artsy like this one. So apparently there's just a, a small little competition within Gibson and this was the winning piece of all those. And it hung up at Gibson for some time, but then they just decided it was time to move it on and they sold it within the mod collection. So that's an added bonus. Over here, we've got the Tuxedo Custom. It's still available. I mean, I'm open to keeping it. I have no doubt if I would have thrown this on Reverb, it would have sold instantaneously. It was one of my website exclusives. But it's a one humbucker Les Paul Custom that had a white front with a black middle section, white back, double stingers. It's just very cool. One of my most well-received reviews this year. Speaking of a well-received review, this was the Christmas Day episode this year, buying a custom color 80s Gibson from the original owner. It's kind of a cool blue finish. It's not a finish that I've seen before, outside of the Union Jack Explorer base coat. So here we've got the tremolo version of the guitar with matching headstock, and then over here we've got the stop bar tailpiece variety. So now I just need to find some of the other versions. I actually had somebody contact me about one that still has the pure white clear coat, so I might be getting that one in the future, I'm not sure. And my snakeskin Firebird over here, and the matching purple one. I collect early 90s, like 1990, 1991 custom color Firebirds. I have the celluloid pick guards that kind of look like Moto, but the reason why they have to be off is they're literally damaging the finish, so <laughs> I've taken them off, and one day it will replace them. I like these things. I, I can't wait to add more of those to my collection. They're some of the ones that make me the happiest. Speaking of being happy, who doesn't want race car car guitars? Okay, I, I do want to clear some things up. I am not a fan of NASCAR. I don't really like the NASCAR signature guitars that much at all. I just ironically love these things because who doesn't want a race car to be their guitar? <laughs> There's also a Jimmy Dean sausage version that I'm still looking for to add to my collection. I actually have a third one of these. I'll use that as trade bait for the other one if anybody wants to do that swap. Over here, we've got a returning visitor. It is my personal Stratocaster. If I ever want a Stratocaster to play, this is the one I grab. I initially bought it for resale only, but this one just blew me away. I love its blue jean simple vibes, and it sounds pretty good. Over here, we have last year's Halloween episode, the Frankenstrat. It was a custom piece. It's actually a Squire, not a Fender, so I can't legally sell it looking like that. And then lastly, we've got a pretty cool Nikki Six bass. Not the one I did the review on, I don't think, anyways. But I always thought these things always looked pretty cool. All right, and this room is where things just get absolutely insane. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start with this one. So this guitar was stolen in transit this year. It's a 1993 Les Paul Custom, and then I found it on eBay, so I ended up repurchasing it. It is a fantastic piece. This one is from 2018. It's part of the Abalone Sparkle Collection. If you're selling any of the other colors, I would be interested in owning a complete set. It's just a beautiful metallic finish, and you got the cool abalone inlays, as well as on the headstock. Next up, we've got a pretty cool one-off 335S. I mean, if you're going to have one of these in your collection, it might as well have cool specs like this one that makes it different is the small block inlays, as well as the heritage headstock style. I'm a big fan of the Gibson M3 Deluxe because even if you're not a shredder guitar guy, they're just beautiful. All the layers of wood, kind of like the Gibson E2 series, where you got maple on the back, Walnut, maple, some more walnut, maple neck. Sometimes you can even find these things flamed. The M3 series in general is just really cool. I want one of each. Here is a very special 2019 NAMM show display piece. This is like the coolest reissue that you can find. I've sold this before and I've bought it back and I'll probably sell it and buy it back again. I don't know, I think this time it's here for me. I call this the Return of Gibson guitar because 2019 was a big year for Gibson, because that's when new ownership came through, and you've got a little sticker to prove it. If you think my asking price now is silly, just give it 30 years. I bet it'll get even crazier. 
This year, I was able to track down a Cobra Burst custom again. Not the same one that I reviewed and documented, but a nice example nonetheless. It is a Sam Ash exclusive guitar. Don't even ask me to sell it. But if you are selling one of the Black Widow guitars, the original ones, let me know. Here's my personal Rick Beato signature. I just think YouTuber guitars are something I support, so I thought I'd pick one up for my collection. We have the Sweetwater exclusive Modern Beauty guitar. What makes it cool is it was made during the Rich Light era, so it was specced out with a rosewood fretboard. Oh, and having a crazy flame neck helps as well. This guitar is too controversial, so I covered it up. Just search controversial Gibson guitar trogly. Next up, we've got my personal collection 2550. What makes this one special is the fact of the very low serial number, 53. My old one was number 24. If anybody happens to have that, I would like number 24 back for sentimental reasons. Speaking of special numbers, here's number 19 out of 79, original run, Adam Jones, Les Paul Custom, age signed, all the good shenanigans. Another one that I've parted ways with twice now, and it always comes back. But since this is a 1979 guitar, having 19 out of 79 makes it cool. Here we've got one of those weird double cut Les Paul Juniors. You can check out the video. It's a strange DC Pro. I mean, it kind of shares the name with those blue ones that we were talking about, but this one came before it and has the Steinberger KBX trem system. This year, I finally got to document a Gibson Standard 82. So this is another one from a collection that I had to buy stuff to get a guitar that I wanted, which we're coming up on here. But I fell in love with it too much. I, I can't part with this guitar. It's not minty like I normally like, but the top is just insane. I've had some crazy offers on this piece, and it's like, nah, there's, there's some guitars that are just too nice to let go. I really like 2018 year Gibsons because it's the last full year of the Henry J era and they did some weird stuff. Like here's the year of the dog Les Paul standard. <laughs> I like it. I, I really do. It took a couple of years for me to warm up to it, but it's kind of like the snake pit and whatnot. It, it's got a dog and it's not a carving, but at least it's a brass plated metal thing on the top. Same thing with this one, a beautiful 2018 Gibson Les Paul Moonless Night. I like this for sentimental reasons, but it's got the rich light fretboard, the nice sparkly finish, mother of pearl inlays, all that good stuff. This, ah oh man, I opened up the case and I was like, oh yeah. Every time I see this one, I'm so happy. This is a 1982 Gibson Les Paul Artisan. So what makes this one special is it has the flip out winding tuners. It's got a rare two piece maple top. It's a three pickup one within the two pickup era. This was a very special piece. I don't regret buying this one at all. Here's another standard 82. I could be convinced to sell this one. I've kind of started to like it though, but I had purchased this one right before I closed the deal on the rest of that collection and where I ended up getting both, but having two of the main colors within the video was definitely not a bad thing. Here's a Gibson Les Paul Snake Pit, a completely 100% authentic one that does not have a huge YouTube story behind it about it being a remade over mid-2000s Les Paul standard that cost me a lot of money. <laughs> oh wait, yes it is. If anyone's selling a, a real snake pit at a real price, I would be in the market for one. But speaking of really cool pieces, the only Gibson Les Paul Dragon that looks exactly like this that was created for the year 2022. It's a phenomenal piece. Like, you really have to appreciate this one in person. It's not about the top. It's not about the back. It's not about the flame figuring on the neck. It's about the inlays. They look very cool in person. They're very dancing. Over here, we've got a 2007 Les Paul 25. Apparently, there were like four different versions of this guitar, according to a person who worked at Gibson at this time, and they made 25 of each. So that's a little bit of a update on here. These are just beautiful guitars, kind of a unofficial 2550th anniversary reissue. Over here we have the SG Elite. It's kind of an interesting blend between a SG Standard and an SG Custom. Speaking of an SG Custom, here's one from the Guitar of the Week series. It's got a replace pick guard. We'll eventually get a review on that one. That's just part of my Guitar of the Week collection. And then the Yeti Les Paul. This beautiful thing. It was worth buying all those other guitars just to get it back. 
<laughs> yep, that's the one that we've been talking about this entire time. So it's a Brazilian rosewood top last ball custom from 1975-ish. There was a small handful of these ones made, but not all of them got to be signed by Les Paul. I've had this Firebird X for a while. I actually got it from Guitar Center for a pretty fair price, and there's only one reason why I purchased this. It's prototype number one. That's pretty cool. Speaking of cool, we've got a very clean Gibson BFG Gator Green guitar. Love these BFGs. I actually just recently purchased one of the reissue ones, so we'll document one of those here very shortly. And lastly for this room, we've got the Georges Saint-Pierre Paisley one. I mean, they're basically just regular Les Paul standards that were all done up custom by this artist. And uh, most of them are ugly. Some of them are zombie virus guitars, but occasionally you find the rare cool one like these Paisleys. So if you find one that speaks to you, definitely keep it for your collection. Time for the next room of goodies. Okay, so this is the limited colors edition where in 1990 they decided to do some limited colors. This is a trans white finish, so you can actually see the wood grain. Same thing with our cherry red over here. You can see the wood grain, it's called trans red. You've got the magenta one over here, which is a Les Paul standard, whereas these guys were customs in case you missed it. You've got a beautiful trans blue, and then a mocha finished one, which is like a trans grayish kind of, a little bit of brown. And you've got a beautiful amber one. It's probably the nicest wood grained one out of the collection. This was a new old stock set that I had purchased from a dealer who went out of business. Now they're supposed to be minty. Were, were they minty when I got them? No, they, they've got hanger rash, some checking, nicks and dings. They still need set up. Haven't done any reviews yet though. I haven't done a review on this one yet either, but I think I bought it last February. This is one of those really cool Les Paul personals, you know, the one that has the gooseneck mic over here. I need the gooseneck mic before I can make this video though. So if anybody has a vintage one that looks the part, please let me know. Over here we've got a Gibson Q100. I've had this one for a while. The model that Gibson tried to win Eddie Van Halen over with. But this guitar was too good to let go for current market value prices. Speaking of crazy guitars. Here is the Studio Custom XPL. Some people mistakenly refer to it as an Aldo Nova model, but it is not. Because that is this. Yeah, I still have my Aldo model. It is a crown jewel of my collection, because to find a early 80s Les Paul reissue with an Explorer headstock again, you're just never going to find it. I mean, technically the pickups are replaced on this one because when I got it, it had 57 classics for some dumb reason. So I, I took some Tim Shaw PAFs out of a double cut XPL. Then over here, we've got this freaky thing. It is called the Gibson US-1. It is a beautiful example of the Gibson Super Strat. Probably the coolest one, in my opinion, but the M3 was definitely a much more ergonomic beast. All right, well, we're gonna start to move a little bit faster here because a lot of these were repeats from last year. So we've got my first Stratocaster over here. It's XL brand. You can check out the full review and demo to learn more. We've got the Epiphone Jared James Nichols that was gifted to me by him. I thought that was very nice of him. I'll never sell that guitar. We've got my personal Taylor 210E guitar. The story of that one is I went to Guitar Center, willing to spend, you know, like three and a half thousand dollars on a guitar that day and this $600 Mexican Taylor took the cake. Here's my first serious Epiphone Les Paul guitar. I had one of the special twos before then. This is what's left of it after I tried to turn it into a 70s, 80s Les Paul custom with like Tim Shaw PAFs. <laughs> I, I, I didn't get too far. This one's just part of inventory. It's the Les Paul Standard Faded, the new series that I had glossed over the top on, and the SG that is currently on my website. This was a gift from a YouTube channel called Scar My Guitar. I think Sean's still doing that channel, but there's a, a little bit of drama between the giveaways and everything. But if you enjoy watching him build guitars and work on stuff, you might check out their channel. This was a, a long time in the making, and it's definitely got some pretty interesting wood grain, but I think they called it the Less G. I've always liked that green quilt top, that's beautiful. Here we've got my Mickey Mouse Telecaster. Just still need to get that Minnie Mouse one to complete the set. Unless I want to get the Stratocasters too. Here we've got that other 12 string Les Paul traditional that I was talking about earlier. This is the first one that has the better figuring in the neck, not that you'd see it in this lighting. And if you need more 12 strings in your life, how about a set of neck through SGs? 
yep, they exist. And I reviewed and documented those this year. This thing took my breath away when I opened the case. So this was a NAM show, Les Paul, kind of a junior, but it's more so mixed with the standard because it's got the full width body. I mean, this was definitely one of my favorite finds this year. And if I remember correctly, I think it was chambered out too. So it's technically a Les Paul Elegant. Same thing with the mummy that I had purchased last year. It's got a kind of a similar vibe going on. Here's that other Heritage 80 I was talking about. I bought this from the original owner, initially just as a resale thing, but it just ended up being such a nice one. A bit of a mix match top, but buying original owner stuff is always cool to me. Here's a minty Les Paul Standard Black Beauty 82. That is a very rare model, let alone finding it in this condition. Here's one that I nicknamed the Hippo. It's kind of like an ES330, but it's got like 335 specs blent in with it being a custom. And it's got that Brazilian headstock veneer over top of it, and the rest of the guitar is also Brazilian, but that was a NAM show display piece in the early 80s. Over here, we've got a Les Paul Rhino. If anybody has one that somebody didn't install the pick guard on, I'd prefer that for my collection, but I love the Rhinos. The original Les Paul Access, the first model to feature the Apex head carve, as far as I'm aware anyway. And yes, I am a Les Paul Deluxe collector. I've got the Basalt Blue Sparkle over here and a beautiful natural example, but I hope to add to this collection over the years. Then, yep, I've got my Spotlight Specials. 1983, I've got a whole video on these guys. I did let one of them go this year. It was that really beat up two-faced top. Honestly, I kind of regret it because <laughs> that was a beautiful guitar, but these ones are a little bit more to my style. Over here, we've got one of the Jim James Owl guitars. I really love animal-influenced guitars. So even though My Morning Jacket's not necessarily a band that I worship, I do like the Owl. There's my other race car, in case I need to get far. And my Modern Flying V. If anybody's selling any of the other colors, let me know. I do have a spare ebony prism, but if I remember correctly, this one was like a really early one from 2017. It's either that or that's the other one. I picked up an additional one for trade fodder, just in case somebody's like, well, I'm only going to trade this if you, you've got the ebony prism, even though this is the coolest finish in my opinion. And now we move on to our last room. This is the Mexican Rocky. So this is technically inventory. I don't think I'll end up keeping it. I'm hoping the uh, Rosewood Telecaster that I ordered for myself still comes in. I had a new guitar day one, but I just sent it out to him before I could review it because he <laughs> already been waiting so long. So we'll see if my personal collection order comes in. Uh, over here, we have one of these Slash 4 Les Pauls. It's technically inventory. I could keep it and collect one of every Slash model, but I'm just not sure if that's what I want to do at this particular point in time. Over here, we have a beautiful L5S, really fancy guitar from the Norlin era. It's supposed to be a flattened L5. It was a very high-end fancy guitar, but this one was special because of the one-piece top. You got the stinger on the back. That's not original though. This was a good find this year. I think it's a 1993 Les Paul Studio House of Guitars 10th anniversary? Maybe it was 30th, I'm not sure, but they made 30 of them. Basically what makes it fancy is you got the J200 inlays over here and ebony fretboard, all that. That's just a great example of an early 90s studio. Over here, we've got the Chet Atkins prototype Tennessean. Not my favorite guitar, even though it's a cool prototype that's stamped. I would gladly trade it. I almost traded it for an Ibanez, and I still might. Over here, we have a beautiful Gibson E2 that got supposedly damaged in shipping a little bit. There's a small crack in the neck pocket. It's stable. It's not a big deal, but it's there. It's just an awesome example otherwise. Over here, we've got a Cherry Sunburst La Tosca. That's a rare 70s model. You can also find it into the early 80s. Over here, we've got the 1994 Gibson Legrand, or Legrand, however you say it, I'm not entirely too sure. This is my attempt to get into high-end jazz arch top guitars. It sat around for a while, but then again, there's a very limited buyer pool for these types of guitars, but beautiful dark wine burst finish, very rare color. Speaking of rare colors, we've got another mod collection guitar here. They called this one Bigger Red. They finished over the fretboard in red. So it's kind of like the Tony Iommi SGs. That's a very unique spec for a Gibson to come stock from the factory. I'm surprised this one hasn't sold. Over here, we've got my tiny little Tacoma Papoose that I purchased because of the guitar guy that does Guitar Hero. Over here, you might think, hey, is that another Buckethead SG? No, it's the Seven String Angel of Death. Strange model, but it was fun to document. 
I don't know how this SG Elegant hasn't sold. It's absolutely beautiful. It's got the rust finish on the back. I don't mind holding on to that if nobody wants it. And we can't forget my blue Les Ball Artisan from 1986. And now as far as our table this year, here's the humbucker version of the Les Paul DC that I was talking about earlier in the rare indigo blue finish. <laughs> I just like the blue ones. I'm not too keen on the other colors, but this one has retained the blue finish very nicely. But that's what it looks like with humbuckers. Here we've got an interesting 50s Les Paul. I think it was a 1954 if I remember correctly. And then he had it double cutted. This one is for sale if you're interested. Still got the original P90s, still the original wrap tail. We just converted it to an ABR1. It's an interesting piece, to say the least. If you don't mind modifications, it's a great way to get into a 50s Les Paul for cheap. Over here, we've got the Chuck Berry ES355. It's the last one that I have. I'm not sure if I'm going to sell it or not. And then over here, I had purchased this from Japan for a viewer of the show, and unfortunately, he passed away. His family sold me his collection, so this one is known as Curtis because of that reason. And we finally figured out more to the story of the 125th anniversary guitars. Apparently, there were only 31 of these things made, according to somebody who works at Gibson. He has the last one because he got it as a 45th anniversary for working at Gibson present. Over here, we've got the Johnny Winter Firebird. I actually have two of these. I mean, if you're interested in trading for one. The market did not love these at 9,000 bucks. And they're Murphy aged. I think they're fantastic Firebirds. One of the best Firebirds I've ever played, but I get it at the same time. Over here, we've got the Lizzie Hale Signature Explorer. Explorer Bird. I wasn't a big fan of this guitar. It's another one of those ones that's just not really selling for me. Although I kind of would like to have one of these for my personal collection. Over here, we have my last Noel Gallagher ES355. A normal 335 figured from the Gibson USA. A Gibson USA slash Anaconda Burst. A Final Fantasy Fender Stratocaster. I am open to selling that one. And then lastly, a 1979 25th Anniversary Fender Stratocaster. All right, troglodytes. Uh, this is the last year that I'm promising that I'll do this because... Uh, it was a good five hours laying all this stuff out. It is nice to see them all together, but I really need, you know, a better display. So eventually we'll get that museum up and running. I hope you troglodytes enjoyed this episode. I'll give you a non-commentated look at these guitars now to finish out the episode. But if nothing else, thank you for watching this year. Your daily view goes towards the goal of eventually opening this museum. And trust me, I've got a whole lot more content planned for the rest of the year because there's like... 30 of them still in boxes, just waiting to get my special touch. <laughs> All right, troglodytes, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll see you tomorrow. Take care.
If you enjoyed tonight's episode, consider subscribing. I post videos like this every day. And you might even enjoy this next one.